Greetings, my friends. It is I, the Great One himself, Cynical Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com on the internet. You can email me at God, that's dog spelled backwards, God, at C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com. Here with an anarchy moment. Today is the 11th of June, 2014. I'm back, like I said I would be. There will not be a new podcast on Friday. What I am going to do on Friday is release... the compilation episode of my entire series I did back in 2005 on utilitarianism and why utilitarianism is bullshit. I also released earlier this week my compilation I did back in 2005 about monogamous marriage and monogamy and marriage. And I was pleased to see that even back in 2005 I was already ahead of the curve on homosexual marriage. As I looked back at my notes, and I listened to part of that podcast, I didn't listen to all of it by any stretch of the imagination, because I got other shit I'm doing. I've been listening to some stuff on Molyneux lately, and got some interesting stuff from him that I'm going to talk about in the future. But it was interesting to see, even when I was a right-wing minarchist, that even back then I understood the concept that people should not need to ask permission from the government to get married. And yet somehow or another, this still eludes the entire LGBT MMPQX7437926 TGBYM militant community who can't stop screeching about how they need more rights which is another way of saying they need more money from heterosexual white men who work for a living. It was just nice to get some affirmation that I am light years ahead of you people, as if that's a surprise. Feeling a little slow right now. I was going to do, we were going to do a full episode of Stating the Obvious, but I decided not to because I got a lot of shit to do. And I just want to throw a couple of things out there. I've talked about before, I'm watching this TV series called Life After People and the way that documentaries nowadays have to over-dramatize everything because people have no fucking attention span and it's impossible for people to simply learn things. Everything has to be dramatized. So that's not what I want to talk about. But as I'm watching the series, they're talking about the Palace of Versailles in France and how all of the mirrors in this place, there's this giant room, it's it's longer than a 747 says the dramatic voice with the music in the background because he can't just say how fucking long it is because that would be too much like education so on these mirrors that line one of the walls of this enormous room that was built at the financial cost of almost bankrupting France. But of course that doesn't matter because you just print more money, right? Because without the state, who would build the roads? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like the saying about how every philosophical conversation at some point always degenerates to bringing up Hitler. There should be an an equivalent rule for how long any anarcho-capitalist can talk without saying the phrase, but who would build the roads? And likewise, how long any statist can talk without saying the phrase, but who would build the roads? (laughs) Anyway, there's all these mirrors along the wall. And the mirrors, the, the overly dramatic voiceovers are, these mirrors contain a toxic, poisonous substance. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, that wouldn't be mercury, would it? And then the dramatic voice says, that is mercury. Each of these mirrors was made with mercury, and people died while making the mirrors from mercury poisoning. And I thought to myself, okay, this is obviously a lie. Mercury is not poisonous, because if mercury was poisonous, the government who cares about you because Obama is the president, he has black skin, and so he is the Messiah and the Savior and the most wonderful human on the planet Earth who's ever lived. He is the second coming of Jesus. 
In fact, he might even be the first coming of Jesus. The first Jesus may not have even been the real Jesus. He may have been an imposter like the Jews believe. Maybe Obama actually is the first Jesus. Maybe he's the first coming. Anyway, if mercury were actually poisonous, would the government of the United States, who cares about you so much and who builds the roads and who takes care of all the poor people and you know protects all the poor people and the old people from anarcho-capitalism where they'd all die in the streets and the government builds the roads. I mean, they build the roads. If mercury was really poisonous, would the government force you to put light bulbs in every room in your home that have mercury in them? Of course not. Mercury cannot possibly be dangerous. It can't possibly be toxic. It cannot possibly be poisonous. This is a lie. And anybody who believes mercury is toxic obviously hates black people. And I think we need to pass speech codes to stop people from saying mercury is a toxic substance because that's obviously just motivated by hate. There's, there's no science behind that whatsoever. I also finished... <clears throat> I also... Hold it. <clears throat> Whoa, all right, hey, got that out. I also finished the book, Why the West Rules, for now, by Ian Morris. And of course, when he got to the end, he dredges up global warming. You see, there's this entire book of very excellent historical analysis in which empires rise and fall due to various conditions. But as we get to the end of the book, suddenly global warming raises its head. And oh my goodness, we need to solve global warming. And how do we solve global warming? Well, the same way all global warming wackos believe in solving global warming. Raising taxes and more laws. So Ian Morris, after the book is huge. I, I don't have the physical book with me anymore. I had it for a while. I listened to it on audiobook. I want to say it's something like 600 pages. It, it's, it's a pretty thick fucking book. After all of this historical analysis, Ian Morris, is, Ian Morris comes to two conclusions. Number one, we're all going to die because of global warming. And number two, the only way we can solve global warming, wait for it, is with, well, I mean, other than more taxes and less freedom. I mean, that's the obvious thing. But where are those taxes and less freedom going to come from? We need a one world government. Yes, see, this is the solution to all of humanity's problems. A one world government. Now, of course, as other people have said, and as I'll say now, just in case I haven't said it before, one world government is the logical next step. If you're a statist, and if you believe government is good, if you believe the state is good, if you believe that the United States having a state, and if you believe China having a state, and Russia having a state, and Britain having a state, if you believe that each of these states having a state and having a government that controls what goes on and regulates freedom and takes people's money away from them and takes their property and does all of this for the good of the people within the boundaries of that state, I mean, if you truly believe, and many, many most of you do, that the state is a good thing, it is a logical next step to say that a one-world government is the logical and rational conclusion, right? Because if you have a state in the United States and a state in China and a state in Russia, well, those states can come in conflict with each other, and those things are called wars. They can also, of course, come in economic conflicts, and all sorts of other forms of conflict can arise. 
So if you believe that the state is a good idea, the logical progression of this is a one world state. Because if there are not all the individual states, there can be no war between the states. There can only be war within the states. Like in the United States, we have the war on drugs, we have the war on terrorism, we have the war on white heterosexual men who work for a living. And so you have wars within states, but those wars are controlled by the state and are inflicted upon the people who are subjects of that state. And for some reason, people are very willing to accept a war inflicted upon them by the state that owns them. I mean, if... And what I mean by that is... So when the police departments in the United States arrest people for having drugs, not a lot of people get outraged about that because, well, it's the government and it's Obama and those people deserved it and yada, yada, yada. Whereas if the Chinese government sent Chinese police officers to the United States and those police officers started arresting people for having drugs, there would be something of a backlash. So people, sheeple, average people, 99 percenters, statist, whatever you want to call them, are almost completely willing to accept a war against the common people if the war is perpetrated by the state that owns them. It's only when a state that doesn't own them makes war upon them that they'll get agitated and worked up. And then, of course, if you believe that a state can, in fact, efficiently allocate resources and make decisions and that it's up to the state to provide justice and all this other stuff, again, the idea, because, of course, people say, you're a conspiracy theorist. You believe in what? No, no, no. I'm not. This one world government is not a fucking conspiracy theory. Now, if you're talking about people who believe that there's the one world government that's controlled by the Jews and the lizard people from outer space that have their base underneath DIA airport in Denver, and I've talked about this before, and it, it's a real conspiracy theory. You know, go to Google, type in lizard aliens, Denver International Airport or something like that. There's this whole, there's documentaries and books and everything about how the lizard people live under Denver International Airport and they're from outer space. And the lizard aliens and the Jews control the planet Earth from under DIA. And this is a real, I mean, that's a conspiracy theory. It, that's not even a conspiracy theory, it's just a weird fantasy. Okay, but when I say that one world government is the logical conclusion of states, this is not a conspiracy, this is a fact, okay? It makes, if you, again, if you believe that governments work and that governments are good, okay, if you have multiple governments, the governments will have conflicts with each other. It will waste resources, it will result in wars. There's a lot of people who will make arguments that war is actually a good thing because it calls out unnecessarily, un, un, it calls out an unnecessary number of men because you only need a small number of men in society so you get rid of a lot of men via wars it also stimulates economies blah 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 so there are people who will make the argument that war is a good thing but if you believe war is bad if you believe waste of resources is bad and yada 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 a one world government would be able to uniformly control everyone it would be able to uniformly control resources there'd be no more wars you would be if you believe that rights come from the government then the, a one-world government would be able to universally enforce rights. So a one-world government is a logical conclusion if you're a statist. The book, Why the West Rules for Now, is still worth reading in spite of its bizarre conclusions about global warming and one-world government final thing I'm going to say in this anarchy moment, and this is part of why I chose not to do a stating the obvious today, is because as I was looking at most of the material I've got queued up to talk about, it's occurred to me 
really, I, I noticed that everything in my queue revolves around femistatism. And as I think back, here on Stating the Obvious, an anarchy moment, I've talked a whole lot about femistatism in the past, in the recent months. And this is intended to be a philosophy podcast, a political philosophy podcast, an anarcho-capitalist podcast. It is not intended to be what I will call, for lack of a better term, a Manosphere podcast. And so I started thinking about why am I spending so much time ragging on femistatist? Like how, what was the process? And see, this is, this is a thing called self-awareness that many of you don't have. I looked at my actions, I look at what I've been doing lately, and I see a change in what's going on. And so much of what I've talked about lately revolves around ripping femistatus to new asshole. And I'm like, why is this? Am I becoming bitter about women or something? Am I you know, not an ANCAP anymore? Do I just have my head up my ass? What the fuck is going on? Why is this transformation taking place? And as I'm thinking about it, I'm formulating this thesis in my brain and it's not ready for public release yet because I've got to work on it still. But I'm formulating this thesis in my brain and the thesis is essentially this. That a feminist and a statist are in fact indistinguishable from each other. Hence my use of the term femistatist instead of feminist or feminazi. And I'm still working on this because there is a there's there's a conclusion that follows from this. And that conclusion okay, so here's the problem. Feminist are almost exclusively left wing. You're not going to find a feminist who is a right wing statist. Feminism is exclusively the domain of left-wing statism. Now, statists, of course, come in left-wing flavor and right-wing flavor. There are right-wing statists. Absolutely no doubt about that. Therefore, if I am going to assert that feminism and statism are exactly the same thing, that is, I am saying, so we'll call feminism, let's do an equation here. Feminism is F and statism is S. So if I say that F equals S, feminism equals statism. This isn't equals like the way women define equals, where they get special privileges and shit like that. This is mathematical equals. This is a boy equals, where like two is equal to two, three is equal to three. They are functionally equivalent to each other. It's that kind of equality, not feminist equality, where men have to buy women's birth control, but if men want birth control, they have to buy it themselves. Right? This isn't feminist equality where men have to register for the selective service, but women don't. This isn't feminist equality where men have to do six chin-ups in the military, but women only have to hang on the bar for 30 seconds. So feminism equals statism. Now, statism has statism has oh, this way. Statism has at least two states of being. Is what I will call them. There is statism L, sub L, and statism sub R. That's statism left wing, and statism right wing. So those are two subsets of statism but they are both statism. So S is equal to SL and S is equal to SR. So if I say that feminism equals statism equals left-wing statism, that makes perfect sense. The conflict 
arises, and this is what I'm working on how to reconcile to see if my thesis is sound or if there's a flaw in it. If that is true, the following must also be true. Feminism equals statism equals right-wing statism. Now, convention tells us, and I've said myself many times, including in this podcast about two minutes ago, that there are no right-wing feminists. However, if right-wing statists are statists, and if statists are feminists, then, by definition, regardless of my fucking feelings, again, this is why I'm smarter than you, because notice how my feelings don't fucking matter. If right-wing statism is statism, and if statism is feminism, that means right-wing statists are feminist. That must be true if everything I said previously was true. Which means either my thesis that statism is feminism is not true, or if statism is feminism is true, that means right-wing statism is also feminism. And that is what I need to work on reconciling and figuring out if that in fact actually holds true. And if it holds true, why does it hold true? If it doesn't hold true, why does it not hold true? So that's where my brain is going right now. I'm also working on notes for the upcoming Stating the Obvious where I'm going to talk about fear in response to a comment left over on the YouTube channel. Go hit me, Cynical Libertarian Society, on YouTube. I don't know what the fucking link is. Use Google. It's not that hard. It's also linked on the website, cynlibsoc.com. So yeah, Friday, Utilitarianism Podcast. I think it's like four hours and something long because originally it was like seven parts or nine parts, whatever. And I'm still still in the middle of working my fucking ass off, which is part of why I took the time away from the podcast, just because I've been so incredibly busy lately you know, you know, doing actual work and creating value for other people instead of getting a welfare check or whining about discrimination and glass ceilings. I've been actually doing stuff to make money. And that was part of the reason why I needed a little time off from the podcast. So Friday will be a repeat. And by Monday, in theory, there's that word theory again. In theory, I'm going to have a new episode up on Monday. However, if I don't, or it may only be an anarchy moment also, because even next week we're slamming back into just more shit. Week after that, I think I've got some downtime. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for listening to the update, and I will see you soon.